Andy Paul, welcome to the Modern Sales Management Show. Josh, it's great to be here. I'm really excited about this conversation. Before we get into too much, can you walk right. us through kind of how, how you got into sales and sales management? Where did you come from and how did you end up where you are today? Because you're one of the most recognized names in sales skills and sales management in the world. Well, thank you. Um... Yeah, as an accidental salesperson, came out of school with a history degree and no discernible job skills except said, except insatiable curiosity and a competitive streak a mile wide. So uh, sort of fell into sales. I saw a job offer, job posting for all these big companies, IBM at the time, big companies, IBM, Burroughs, Xerox, and they had the sales training programs. and. Yeah, applied, got first interview with Burroughs, who at the time was the second largest computer company in the world, in a fabulous training ground um, for learning how to go out and knock on doors and, and sell things. So yeah, started there and then uh, moved into management about two years and managed the uh, same group of people or same type of sellers selling computer systems to the small and mid-sized businesses. And from there, actually interesting story is that I, we started seeing more, this was in the early 80s, uh, we started seeing more personal computers show up on scene when we were getting ready to sell. Well, in the one case, I was going down with my sales guy to close a $60,000 deal uh, with a company in Fremont. I was based out of Oakland in the Bay Area. And I talked to the owner himself. He's ready to sign the deal. We show up the next day to sign it. And he says, yeah, I've got a problem. So I'm not going to be able to do this. And he turns around and points at an Apple II with a tiny little monitor sitting on the credenza behind his desk. And he said, yeah, I was in computer land last night. And they told me this thing can do for $2,000, can do everything your $60,000 computer do, which it couldn't at that time at all. Uh, like had spreadsheets, they're basically selling on a bill of goods. But um, I think they just introduced three and a half inch floppy drives. But nonetheless, it's sort of a trend. And, and I literally left that meeting and went back to the office and called a friend of mine that had just joined Apple and said, got any openings? Because <laughs> the future was pretty plain to see. So yeah, I worked at Apple in the early days for a couple, couple years, uh, a couple more PC startups after that. And then uh, one, the last one was kind of a, a glorious failure as we were, the company was making the first battery powered notebook computer. And um, couldn't really make it work, it was sort of ahead of its time technology-wise, so certainly for mass production. And yeah, the company shuttered. I went home, saw, saw an uh, article in Fortune magazine, actually, the day I got home, about a company in the Bay Area and Mountain View that was revolutionizing the satellite communications industry for data transmission, a company called Equatorial Communications. And so I cold called the VP of sales on the following Monday, I got an interview, got a job that uh, really transformed my career from perspective of introduced me to really large two things introduced me to subscription based services and selling really large deals and uh, and also uh, eventually I got promoted to run all of international sales, which was something new as well so yeah, just um, spent four years there and uh, uh, soon thereafter, yeah joined a company in um, San Diego that recruited me to be VP of sales. So I started my first VP of sales job, uh, just turned like 34 years old and uh, as a venture funded startup, also in satellite communications business. And so I sort of stayed in that field with that company. We sold that company and then joined another company called Viasat. Uh, that was, at the time it was a small defense contractor doing sort of $5 million a year. And I was hired to start a commercial business and uh, we grew that to about 100, 125 million dollars. I left. They're now the multi-billion dollar company. But in 2000, I started my own company. And so for really since the last 20 years until earlier this year, uh, I was working with a variety of different companies around the country. Uh, working as CEOs, sort of a sales whisperer, I guess, for, for CEOs uh, to help transform their sales results. And then, um, yeah, early this year, I've had a podcast myself for a number five years almost now, but earlier this year, my podcast was acquired by a company called Ring DNA. And uh, so now I'm sort of podcasting for a living. It's kind of fun. Hey, just teaching and sharing. That's 
That's yeah. a good way. You know, waking yeah. up every morning and doing that, helping people is a good way to live. It is. And obviously I'm passionate about the topic. I mean, I'm, I still feel, you know, through doing the podcast, uh, I tell folks it's the most selfish thing I've done in my career because where else do you get the excuse to talk to, in our case now, close to 900 really smart people uh, about sales and marketing, leadership, management, all these variety of topics. And I certainly have, have grown as a result of it. And, you know, at this stage of my career, that's, that's one of the great pleasures to keep on learning. So this is the Sales Enablement Podcast. Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, yes. I, I love and, it. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's really, we, have, we take a broad definition of sales enablement, sort of along the lines of, of what Gartner talks about is, is that, you know, we'll talk about anything and everything that enables reps to have knowledge-based conversations with their customers that the customers feel are valuable. Uh, sales enablement is a term that's it's driven me nuts for years uh, because it, it either meant too many things to too many people or it meant nothing to anybody. Right. Well, well I think, is, I'm is sorry, that, go ahead. No, I mean, is that, is that, do you still run into that or has it landed in a place that resonates with people? Well, we're trying to push the definition I just gave you, which is a fairly broad definition of it. You know, initially, and still for a lot of people, uh, sales enablement is about you know, content management, right? Serving up the right content at the right time to sellers. Or to other people, it's about training, right? Do we train the reps? Or if others, or the third leg of the triad was uh, coaching. So coaching, content, training, sure, all, all important. But, you know, I think that, again, anything you can talk about that, as I said, enables reps, sellers to have, you know, these value-based, knowledge-based conversations with customers, that's part, that should fall under sales enablement. So it's, it's fairly broad, I think. Um, and it's a really important role. The, the term itself, um, it, it, for several years, it felt like the only people who were pushing the term were people who were selling sales enablement services or sales enablement software. Yeah, well, I think one of the dangers uh, that some companies are, are gonna run into and others are a little more foresightful about it. They're taking the broader view. They're hiring the right level of person to run the, the, uh, the sales enablement program. You need to have sort of a visionary in that role, you know, that has sort of a broader perspective as opposed to sort of a, you know, a trainer, right? I mean, it's an important person to have as part of the team, but uh, it's not who you necessarily want running it. This is really a strategic thing. You know, how do you help your sellers improve their performance is the bottom line. So I think at some point we'll see this sort of, this is my feeling, is sort of this hybrid role that's enablement, that's really is about performance improvement, um, performance. You're even seeing now some people have, you know, quality control functions for revenue. Uh, I think it's the aspects of all those in the sales enablement role. So what types of companies need sales enablement programs and what does a sales enablement program look like? I mean, it, it can look like a thousand different things, but paint the picture of some specifics. Yeah, well, I, I, it could be anything, I think is what you talked about. I, I don't think that I have, you know, a, I have a vision of what I would see it being as, and I sort of just talked about it as, as uh, I think we sort of gone maybe too far on the, the content side as an enabler. I think for me, the enabler is really about how do we enable the individual to be in a better position to have these knowledge-based interactions. And so, you know, one area in particular, I think that we really fail and you don't see many programs have at all is how are we training sellers to acquire the necessary business acumen to have the conversations that they need to have? Yeah, because one of the things we see in survey after survey is, is uh, C-level decision makers or C-level stakeholders uh, saying, yeah, we just don't see enough value coming from our interactions with sellers. I think Gartner had a study a couple of years ago. It was like 80% of C-level people saying, yeah, we don't see any value in our interactions with salespeople. And it's not because they don't want to deal with the sellers as they just can't help them. And I think that's really sort of that critical divide is, is I don't think buyers avoid talking to sellers that when they want to talk to sellers, there's a reason for it is they need information. They need insights. They need something they can't find otherwise find. And we're also going to get it, but the salesperson 
Um, and so, but the salesperson at that point has to be prepared, has to be enabled to, to succeed. So again, it's not, I see training as part of it, but you know, I think this whole idea of how can we train people to be prepared to have those conversations, understand the issues behind them uh, is one that's really missing. So if I'm a sales manager and I know there's that gap, my team, I, I don't have confidence that they can sit on the same side of the table as a C-level executive and whiteboard out a, mm -hmm. a roadmap with them rather than being on a separate sides of the table and being buyer and seller. What steps would I take as a, a manager to start preparing my team? <laughs> That's, that's really a good question, right? Because I haven't seen anything that's been effectively done in that regard. I mean, unfortunately, most of it's acquired sort of through uh, watching somebody else do it, right? I mean, that's how a lot of us learn is go out on calls with managers or coaches and they, we sort of hear the words they say and we put them into our own words and, and go forward. But I think one thing is, is that companies have to take some responsibility now for just sort of basic business education as part of their training curriculum. So as companies look at implementing online training or even in-person training, is what aspect of that has to do with just teaching people the fundamentals of business? You know, it, it's a problem I encounter when I talk to sales, salespeople, AEs, SDRs, whatever function they have, is like, they just don't understand how a business operates. You know, what's, what's accounts payable? What's accounts receivable? What's, yeah, what, do, what does operations do? Yeah, you know, they need to have this grounding and sort of basics in order to build on it. And yeah, I, I didn't get that either. I mean, I developed it because uh, my dad gave me this advice is to make sure I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal as soon as I graduate from college. So I was reading about business every day. Uh, yeah, it's skip the op-ed pages, but yeah, business. And that combined with, I was sort of fortunate, my first product I was selling out of school is computers that, for accounting applications. For, so, you know, I learned businesses sort of inside and out, uh, small and mid-sized businesses, dealing with CEOs and CFOs and controllers and so on, implementing general ledger, accounts payable, accounts receivable, billing, uh, ERP systems and so on. Um, so absent that is, I think you have to have in your curriculum uh, modules, and I think there are some available that just teach people the basics of business. How does a company operate? How does a company make money? And then they can extrapolate that and say, okay, well, this is how my prospect, I can now analyze, how does my prospect make money? How can we help them make more money or achieve market share, or whatever they want? I think that it's a really good point that I don't see enough. Uh, we assume. Yeah, we assume that people understand these things and it's, it's the wrong assumption to make. Where, where does a new grad, you know, coming into sales, into the sales world, where have they learned this? Unless they're an undergraduate business major, but yeah, most sellers aren't. No, absolutely. When my company was smaller and I was the, the one who was doing the selling, I, I noticed the shift that when I brought on salespeople and built out a sales team, that they were missing, missing that component. It's not something we've completely solved, but you're speaking to exactly what I've gone through as a business yeah. owner. Well, I think the, the other thing, too, is, is I would say as part of enablement is need to bring in more uh, disparate points of view into the sales world. And it's very easy to get caught up. Hey, we've defined the sales process. That we're going to implement this at our company. This is the way it works. This is the way to succeed. And yeah, my experience has shown that actually, yeah, everybody has their own unique way of selling. And increasingly sales has become sort of compliance-based, right? We've got a process, you need to comply to the process. And we don't focus on making people or enabling people to become the best version of themselves. And How do you find that balance between kind of quality control and following the process and allowing people to use their creativity and ingenuity? Experimentation. I mean, I think that you have to give people some freedom because when doing so, and there's been tons of research about this, Charles Duhigg writes, writes about it in, in uh, Smarter, Faster, Better, is, is when people have agency over the choices they make, that you know, they tend to follow through better. They tend to have that sense of ownership in it. And they see on balance, see better outcomes from those decisions. So I think that 
rather than we have this one trend now with technology where people say, well, the, the goal of technology is to uh, reduce the reliance on the salesperson's judgment about what to do at any one point in time in the sales process. When instead, what we should be doing with the technology is saying, how do we amplify the salesperson's judgment to help them make better decisions? Because it still will be a better decision than and have more context to it, which the machines can't understand. Um, than what, yeah, what the machine could tell them to do. Is that where your interest in guided selling comes in? Well, yeah, because I think guided selling can help that, right? I think you give people more information in the moment to help them make better decisions instead of saying, let's, let's just have the machine make the decision for them. I think, uh, and I th so I think that's, that's my perspective on it. The idea of experiment, experimentation gives a lot of sales leaders a lot of anxiety. Um, sure. At what point, because finding that balance, because it's, it's somewhat fluid, is, uh, can be stressful. You know, they, they want a process. At what point do you take the results of an experiment and incorporate it into a process that everyone should follow? Can you find something that works? How fluid is it? Well, the question is, would it work for everybody? And I think this is one of the issues we're confront confronting in sales these days is we're trying to say, look, we can analyze a phone call and we'll analyze 100,000 phone calls and we'll say, yeah, if you use these three words at this point in time, you're going to increase your odds of winning the business. Yeah, but there's so much missing in that analysis. There's context missing, right? is you know, who the sellers are, a man selling to a man, a man selling to a woman. You know, I could list a dozen variables just on that alone. So I think what, what I don't know, I, my inspiration early in my life was, uh, I was a Green Bay Packer fan and the coach was Vince Lombardi. And uh, Vince Lombardi ran a fairly, he was criticized for running a pretty stripped down offensive playbook. And, but what he was also famous for was this expression I talked about, giving the players freedom within structure. And meaning that, yeah, we have a structure, we have a process, but you have the freedom to try things out to perform to the best of your ability within that structure. And I think that's what managers have to feel less fearful about doing that. And because they're limiting their upside by doing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's taking a risk. Unfortunately, I think uh, I don't know if it's changed. It feels like it's changed over the last 20, 30 years is, is that sales managers have become that's a, more fear, fear driven. Right. And we sort of see the results of that because we've got, you know, in the tech world, average tenure of a VP of sales is like 17 or 18 months. Is that a result of leadership higher up in the company and, and how they understand sales and, and the goal uh, or don't sales? or don't. Yeah. Or don't. Yeah, well, I think that I think part of it's an artifact of the fact that that now everybody just looks at sort of a handful set of metrics and sort of activity driven and use that as the barometer for whether this person is succeeding or not. And so I think, you know, if you're going to look at things in such a superficial way, decisions come to their black and white. You know, is this person staying or they're going? Um, and you know, the irony is when you get somebody that only stays for a year, year and a half is they can't begin to implement their system, their own process, hope, which hopefully they have their own philosophy for how, you know, their team should be selling. And, um, you know, what we've seen in certain sectors is, you know, a lot of these managers are just managing by the metrics and don't have a deeper philosophy of just, you know, managing through the process. And it's, it's self-defeating from day one. So I, I think that, yeah, I don't know the exact answer, but I mean, I think, yeah, it really comes from the higher ups. Just looking at sales is sort of a necessary evil in most cases and saying, what can we do to sort of reach our revenue numbers with minimal investment? In your years as a CEO whisperer for sales, you learned a lot about their perspective and mindset towards business development and the, the sales organization at their mm. company. What surprised you the most about what they do or don't understand if you had to generalize? Well, the, I think in general, to, again, broad generalization, because certainly I worked with CEOs that are much more enlightened. Um, but I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I spoke at a 
keynoted a function, which was the CEOs of portfolio company of a private equity firm. And, and I was just trying to communicate a simple message about investment and sales. And so I said, well, yeah, who's, who's going to raise their quotas next year? And everybody raised their hand. And like I was you know, looking at my like guys nuts and, and then I said, well, it's by how much? And so we sort of came around. I think the average turned out to be about 12% quota increase across the board in the room. And I said, okay, so who's has in place the investments and can measure that your salespeople are going to be 12% better next year. <laughs> and I was like, no one, right? I mean, it's just, we're going to raise quotas and we're not tying it all to our investment and in our people. Right. So, so are we investing to make sure that they are sufficiently upskilled and increase their capacity and capabilities in order to achieve a higher number of which only 50% were hitting the number this year anyway. And so, yeah, we can't just operate in isolation. Like, yeah, let's pick a number out of the air and make that our quota next year without saying, how are we investing in the team? How are we upskilling them? How are we enabling them to improve at the uh, perform at these higher levels? So that's just one example where it's just like, there's a huge disconnect. Um, is it yeah, another, bigger? another one is, well, is I, was just, I was just saying another one is, is research has shown that, that perhaps the number one thing a sales organization can do to improve the performance of the individual contributor is, is provide them effective coaching. And I, I've done some informal surveys of people and you ask people, well, how'd you learn how to sell? And other than your own experience, what was the biggest influence on you? And they most all say, well, a manager or a coach. So we got this research that says that, we got the informal research that says it. And then you say, okay, well, how are you investing as an organization into developing your managers into more effective coaching? Coaches. And it's almost none. Crickets. So just big disconnect from the top to what really needs to happen. What's your view on sales coaching versus sales training? Well, I, yeah, I'll say it this way, is I think that building on the numbers I just talked about, the, I think it was 19% improvement in, in uh, individual contributor performance based on effective coaching, is we spend r roughly $20 billion a year in the US on sales training. And of that, I, there's no hard figure that I saw, but my estimate is maybe 5% of that total let's say a million, a billion dollars is spent on training managers. And so I've asked people, I said, so what do you think would happen to sales results if we flipped that investment? And we spent $19 billion training managers how to become more effective coaches and just a billion dollars on training the sellers. Because we all know they forget half of it or 90% of it within 30 days anyway. Um, but I just serve, again, informally ask people this question on my, my podcast and almost to a person, they say, well, sales would go up if we did that. <laughs> well, it's like, okay, maybe it's a little extreme, but I think the point is made is, is that we know this is a very important lever in helping people become better salespeople and we invest nothing in it. It's, I mean, it's profound. I hadn't thought of it. I'm, I'm in this world, but I hadn't thought of it that way. I did notice when we when we did launch the Modern Sales Management podcast that most of the sales podcasts out there are for individual sellers, and uh, there, there wasn't a lot for the art and science of, of sales management. Yeah, and I think that that yeah, you know, part of what we're just missing is just more thoughtfulness about this whole thing. You know, let's look at the whole equation, and if we become less driven by uh, conversion metrics, you know, throughout the stages of our process and more focused on how do we actually sell? How does a customer actually make a decision? How do we influence that decision? Uh, and, you know, what are the attributes our sellers need to have in order to help influence that decision? That'd be a, a huge thing to start with. But instead, you still see a ton of hiring managers looking for attributes like, you know, I need a I need a hunter, I need a closer, I need an extrovert, I need whatever. And 
if you were to go survey your customers and say, you know, how valuable would it be to you to have a hunter or an extrovert selling to you? They would say, not at all. So we have this huge disconnect in terms of what we think we're selling. We should be hiring for the attributes that benefit our, our buyers. You know, what they want is they want curious, open-minded problem solvers, right? Help curious, them. Curious, open-minded problem solvers. Yeah. Help them make a purchase decision. Your job isn't, and this again gets back to sort of change a difference in perspective, but I think little changes in perspective have huge impacts is you know, if you ask most sellers what their job is, they say, well, my job is to sell my product. And my thought is, well, no, that's not your job. Your job is to help your buyer make a purchase decision. Solve the problem. Yeah. So when you have that change in perspective, that changes how you go about your job. I think that's, that's the biggest takeaway I've had from this conversation is the, the need for more thoughtfulness throughout the entire process, starting with the executive team, the VP of sales, the sales manager, and, and instilling that in the, the sellers themselves. Yeah, no, I think that, that people don't want to hear it, but sales is fundamentally managed the same way it's been for the last hundred years. Yes, we may have more insight, more data, but it's basically the same. And until we take a different look at it and look at it more thoughtfully about, again, what is our customer trying to achieve and how do we help them achieve that? Um, yeah, we'll still be stuck, sort of numbers driven. You know, we sort of reach the apotheosis of this in, in many SaaS companies where they're so focused on top of funnel that they really don't sell much anymore. They just play the odds. I think that there's, we're just at the beginning of uncovering the opportunity there uh, to, to redefine things, look at them differently, do things differently. So for the, those people who are listening today, um, there is no defined methodology around fixing sales and, and doing things differently than it's been for the past 100 years. So for people listening today, if you can start making that change and start seeing things differently, um, there's an opportunity for you no matter what industry you're in. What do you think about that, Andy? Oh, I agree. I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I think that one of the disservices that, that uh, we tend to do in this business, especially those of us who are you know, writing a lot and you know, doing podcasts and so on, is this tendency to talk about transformation. And I don't, you know, if you're listening to this or you listen to my show, I'm not really that concerned of having you wake up tomorrow and transform yourself into something different. I'd like you to be maybe just one degree different, right? Let's just start. If we can get that one degree difference in perspective and change. You know, I like using that sort of rule of thumb that aviators use that, you know, if you're heading at a certain course and if you change, you're off by one degree for what, for every 60 miles you fly, you're one mile off, right? And, and yeah, yeah, I, I tell the story of, of, you know, my dad was a navigator in World War II on a B-29. So he's 21 years old, navigator B-29, taking off from this fly spec island in Pacific and flying five, 1,500 miles to Japan. On his first mission over Japan, it, they get hit by flak, they lose an engine, and they get separated from the squadron that's returning back to the, the island. So he's navigating at dark, at night, over 1,500 miles of Pacific Ocean. And, you know, if he was just one degree off, you know, they would have landed in the middle of the ocean. Just one degree, it makes it so powerful, right? It's just, uh, just it's so true. powerful, one degree. So uh, people listening to this, yeah, you want to change, you want to improve, but don't do it such big bites that's not sustainable is, is how are you going to change your perspective tomorrow from what you're doing today? I think, I think that's a really good note to... Uh, to wrap this up on, and I, I do like that story. The, um, so we're, we're going to link to your podcast in the show notes. If people want to connect with you, follow you, and read or listen to more of what you have to teach, where can they find you online? Sure. So the Sales Enablement with Andy Paul podcast, find that on all your favorite podcast platforms. Um, 
I think we're 820 episodes close to this week. Um, LinkedIn is the best place to connect. So the usual preamble, LinkedIn, it's real Andy Paul is, is the name to search for, or Andy Paul. Excuse me. And yeah, we post content there several times a week. So that's sort of the primary venue. Then you come to ringdna.com and uh, once or twice a week, I have a blog post there as well. That's great. So before we go, uh, we covered a lot of a pretty wide range of topics mm -hmm. today and I really enjoyed this. Is there any last bit of advice that you would want to give to the CEOs, chief revenue officers, VPs of sales that are listening today? Uh, you know, get outside your comfort zone. You know, read new things, read books. There's lots of new books being written about uh, performance improvement, learning, continuous learning, um, you know, mindset, you know, listen to podcasts is learn because ultimately you're going to make a decision about whether or not to implement changes. And it'd be great if you were really prepared to have those conversations. Yeah, you know, last story is just... People used to ask me, how did I choose my clients when I was consulting? And I said, it's quite easy. You know, I'd walk into their offices and I'd look at the size of the stack of books on their desk. And that told me all I needed to know about who I wanted to work with. I like that approach. It's a really good note to end on. Andy, Paul, thank you so much for the, your time today. This conversation was enlightening. And that does it for this episode of the Modern Sales Management Show. Thank you for listening.